Okay, thank you, Jack. So recent years, scalars have become quite a popular. Um, if you look at hackage, then you can see that uh, um, thousands of files are using the language extension GDTs. And one reason for this popularity is probably that um, GDT supports some type of level computation, and which uh, uh, in turn allows us to say enforce very expressive invariants of data structures. For example, um, enforce the well-formedness of red and black trees. So I'm going to use this simple example to illustrate the um, benefits of JGTs in case that you are not familiar with them. So we have um, this, this um, data type expert, and then we have three constructors. And in particular, when we uh, define plus, our intention is to say that, OK, only expressions that are evaluated to intervals can be used as uh, arguments to parse. But we know that this is harder to do in um, ADTs. And moreover, if we want to define a, an evaluator function for um, this expression, then we see that uh, this expression can potentially evaluate to int or bool. So we will define this data type of bool to serve as the codomain of the evaluator function which um, itself is very easy and straightforward. But if you look at this um, plus case, then you find this is cumbersome, right? We have to worry about that uh, maybe E1 or E2 don't evaluate to, to int. And now this is the uh, GDT case. So here we have, uh, we can see that the difference is that uh, the return type of these constructors, they can um, be different. And in fact, there are the refinements of the uh, data type expert that's being defined. So another um, thing is that we see that this kind of specify expert int, so we no longer can use expression like expert bool as arguments to, um, to parse. And now this evaluation function is uh, very straightforward. There's no need to worry about whether E1 or E2 don't evaluate to int. So this is good. But uh, there's um, certain challenges here. Um, in particular, they are kind of polymorphic recursion, and we know that uh, um, type inference with that is undecidable. And the second problem is that the loss of principal types. Now here's an example of uh, what's the meaning. So we are given this frog one function, and with this uh, three data constructors. So now the question is that what are potential types that we can assign to frog one? Well, first type is i to int. Well, we should all um, be comfortable with that. Now, um, interestingly, another, another type that we can assign is i to a. Well, the reason is that uh, um, when we do pattern matching, so they introduce the local assumption that, that says that a is essentially the same as int. So now whenever we want to say int, we can use, essentially use a to replace that. Now, um, this is why we can use a as the return type of the function. Now the problem is that, as you can see, that neither type is more general than the other one, right? So, and this makes type inference um, impossible. Now one thing we can do is that, uh, okay, ask for type annotations. But actually type annotations themselves have um, several problems. The first problem is that um, they can be incorrect. And once they're incorrect, then you will um, have a very bad uh, impact on type inference. And the second reason is that um, there's just no simple rule about when and where um, type annotations are needed. So our goal here is that uh, do type inference without type annotations. And uh, um, so our approach based on the um, insight that although neither type is more general than the other type, and probably we cannot pick up a, uh, a type that's uh, better, but actually we can pick a um, precise type in this case. Right, so okay, we can say that this type is, is precise. Um, so why do we, uh, why we say that? Well, let's look at these three expressions and let's uh, um, um, possibly assign these, any of these type to FROP1. So if we assign i into two int to FROP1, then we find that this data two expression, they are rejected, simply because the uh, arguments are not of type i int. Um, and this is done at compile time, so that's good. And in this case, if we will assign any of these to FROP1, then we find that all of these will be accepted at the compile time. Now, what about a runtime? Well, the runtime, um, again, these two expressions, they will be, um, have problems in like um, non-exhaustive pattern matching failure and so forth. 
So we can see that this essentially catches the problem at the compiler. Now the question is, that can we generalize this idea? So let's look at, let's add one more alternative. Now what's the type of the FROP2 uh, function? Well, it seems that this is the only type that we can assign to FROP2. And actually the authors of outside in have pointed out that uh, to make this type precise, we have to constrain A to either um, internet bool. And they have further observed that this is not possible with ordinary type syntax. Now in light of these observations, we propose to introduce choice types into this type syntax. So now um, this is uh, uh, the type uh, FROP2, uh, uh, essentially applied, uh, assigned to FROP2. Now uh, after this extension, we get this type. So this is slightly more complicated, and I will explain what's the meaning of this type. So the first thing it says that if the argument types are int, then the result type A is int. And if argument type is are bool, then the result type is bool, and nothing else. Now first, let's take a brief look about uh, what's choice types. So choice types essentially encode um, a list of types, and if there are the relation between them, they are um, uh, alternative. So this is a very simple example. Um, and the choice type consists of a dimension, um, which kind of names the variation point. And also, they um, um, include the alternative type that are encoded by the choice type. So, and we refer to rint as the first alternative and apple as the second alternative um, always. So the purpose of the, um, this dimension is to synchronize the uh, different variation points. Now what's the meaning? Well, this is an example that uh, we say these two choices, they are synchronized. The reason is that uh, they are uh, under the same, uh, same dimension. So this means that if we select a certain alternative um, in one choice, then we have to uh, select uh, the corresponding alternative in other choices under the same dimension. Now this is the case that uh, we have uh, choice types that they are independent. So once they are synchronized, we have two possible types. And this actually encoded four possible types for, for um, and um, as, as well, this um, encoded two types. So a very important notion of uh, working with choice type is this uh, called type equivalence situation, which essentially allows us to transform types into other forms without uh, affecting their meanings. So there are many reasons that can give rise to choice types, uh, to type equivalence, and uh, we will look at uh, two reasons. The first reason is that when we distribute type construct over choice types. So when we go from this type to this type, we say they are equivalent um, because basically from here to here, we have distributed the function type construct into this, this um, choice constructor. And another reason that we say they are equivalent is that you see they encode the same types. And the second reason for that, them to be equivalent is that we reduce a redundant choice. Now this is a, uh, an example. So here you see that there are two choice types that are nested. And as we said that uh, they are synchronized. So this means that this type is unreachable. Well, the reason is that if we take the first alternative, we always take R int. If we take a second alternative, we always take R And again, both of them encode these two types. So with this, we can kind of interpret the meaning of choice types. Well, we can say that uh, this means FROP2 has two potential types, R int to int or R to bool. And in general, choice type can help us in following ways. Well, first, um, we can assign more precise types to um, expressions. And the second is that uh, it helps us to avoid or at least delay the harder questions of finding appropriate types to case expressions, right? We know that with other choice types, we cannot find a kind of best type or whatever for, uh, for case expressions, but now with choice type, we can. And this helps us to eject more expressions at a, com at a compile time that will yield um, runtime um, pattern matching failures. And uh, another thing is that we are now able to assign a type to any expression, and this will um, allow us to in for the type for um, most JDT expressions without type annotations. Now the in introduction of choice types into type system will have impact to their uh, typing rules. 
And in fact, the application rule and uh, the case expression rule that are affected the most. So let's look at uh, uh, several examples to show that uh, what's the impact and how we deal with that. So we um, get a type this for prop two and uh, get this for the um, argument. Now if you look at this, uh, the type of the argument, argint, and uh, look at the ty um, argument type, you see that they are not matched exactly. So what we do is we um, decompose this into two steps, which we call match. And again, we need a device to describe that uh, how well these two types match. So we introduce this pattern to describe that. And this top sign essentially uh, means that uh, that corresponding alternative is well matched, and the second alternative, that's not well matched. So the second step is do filter, right? Um, so essentially, the, this process to filter this type, uh, this corresponding to this one well-matched well alternative out. In this case, we get an int, right? So overall, we say that this H1 has type int. Now, look at this expression. We see that if we do match, then um, neither alternative will be well-matched. So overall, uh, when we do filter, we cannot filter anything out. So overall, we say that H2 is not well-typed. And this is a more complicated uh, example, uh, H3. So for now, we assume that uh, we can assign this type to the case expression and assign this type to the variable one. Now when we do match, we see that uh, this, these two types match exactly. So we get a uh, top sign, and when we do um, filter, we have this type as a return type of, um, the real type of this uh, application. So there are actually uh, more cases and examples in the paper, and uh, we used uh, Uniformed, um, unified rule to handling all these different cases. Now we have two questions left. Well, the first question is that uh, how do we get the type for this? And the second question, how do we get the type for this? So now let's look at the first question, and this deals uh, with how to type case expressions. So again, this is just a simple example, and the rule is um, kind of more complicated and it's um, shown in the paper. So what we do first is that we kind of get a type for this case alternative, right? We have this type under this assumption. And in fact, we can um, get this type with any assumption. And similarly, we do the same thing for the second alternative. Now we see that uh, these alternatives, they have different types. So what we do is we kind of create a choice type, okay, to enclose these two types. And as well, we, we see that these are two uh, type environments that they use for typing uh, the first and the second alternative. So correspondingly, we form a um, one type environment that will be used for typing both alternatives. And this, the result is this. So if you look at this, then we can get that the type for the scrutiny X will have this type. Now you can see that the type of the scrutiny actually matches the pattern type. Overall, we say that uh, the, the type of this case expression is this. But this seems to say in that uh, as long as case alternatives are well typed, then the case expression is well typed. But actually, this is another case, right? Um, so here are two uh, functions, um, and uh, they're slightly different. So we can assign a type to each of these expressions. Right? And, but notice the difference, this has kind of swapped the, the alternative one the int. Now the reality is that uh, straight is well typed, the cross is not well typed in Garrett's. Um, so, and we found that uh, we can um, find i to a to each alternative, so we say that uh, um, straight is well typed. And now we can find only i to bool and i to int to this alternative. As a result, we cannot find any type that is subsume both types. So overall, we say that this is, um, this is why um, cross is reje rejected in Garrett's. So, and then the question is that how do we reject um, cross in our Garrett's um, type system? And our uh, requirement is that um, a case expression is well typed only if its type can be reconciled to a plain type. Now, type is plain if it doesn't contain any choice. So this is um, an example to show in this um, process. So we have this type, this can be reconciled to this type because we can find this mapping. 
essentially, we, um, by substituting A with this, we get this type. So this is kind of we uh, reconcile this to a plain type. Now we have uh, two conditions. We only can reconcile type uh, variables that inside um, GDT type constructor, and we only do this for um, function arguments. And then we can do this um, successfully only if that um, the plain type can be uh, brought to exactly the same as version of type. Now let's look at this. Now the question is that can we um, reconcile this type to any of these? Well, the answer is no, because there are no mappings that can bring, for example, this type to this type, because we are only uh, allowed to map a type of variable A and another type of variable B. So no matter what, this will not um, be correct. So, and this is how we reject this cross function. So now we are left with the second question. The second question is that how do we get a type for variable Y? Um, so essentially we do this for, with the type inference and we first assign a type variable A to um, the variable Y. And now we are left with this rational unification. So, and this has a most general unifier as this. Now you see that uh, um, now with this most general unifier and this type of variable A, we can read the uh, type for variable Y as, as, as this. Um, and you can see that uh, um, now this unification variation unification is very straightforward. But actually solving this unification problem is, uh, has some trickiness. And I'm going to show you with one example. So we try to unify these two types um, so that we find a substitution so that when substitute the variable B, then these two types will become equivalent. Now um, our first attempt is try to decompose. So we get a two sub problems and we uh, solve each sub problem, we get these two results. So essentially what we try to do is we try to now try to merge. Now the problem is that it seems that we try to map B to both int and bool. And it seems that we have no solution. But in fact, we have this most general unifier, theta. Now why is this a, 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 a solution to this problem? Well, let's do substitution. We get these two type from this and get this type from this when we, after we do substitution. Now you can see that this type is unreachable and this type is unreachable. So essentially, both of these two types, they are equivalent to this type because the type of equivalence is transitive. So these two types, they are equivalent. And this shows that our original, very straightforward uh, um, approach seemed to be incorrect. And the correct solution is actually a simple modifi modification to um, um, our previous uh, approach. So we have to respect that uh, these problems, they have to, to be solved in their own context. Namely that this problem have to be solved in the left or D1, and this have to be solved in D2. So now we can solve each um, sub problem, and uh, when we do uh, merge, we have to respect that this comes from different contexts of the um, choice B. So as a result, we just map um, uh, this D to intent bool. So when you look at this um, overall process, you find that, okay, so that it works, but uh, um, it's complicated. And in particular, if we have multiple choices, then they can be nested and they can appear in multiple places, so the communication will be hard. But fortunately, we can get rid of choice types. And this is an example showing this process. So first we know that H3 we can assign to this type based on our um, previous reasoning. And now it's equivalent to this type, right? We put, uh, as I said, we pull the R out of here. So this is essentially the inverse of the distribution of choice type. Um, so now we can kind of um, map, uh, substitute this D inter, inter bool with this A and we get this mapping. And now what we do is we try to look if we can um, know, um, replace all this interval with A. And we find that we can. So this is uh, um, how, how we uh, reached this simplified type. And the cost is, of course, this is not so precise anymore. So I'm going to jump into the um, um, detail of the algorithm since I run, I'm run out of time. So what I'm trying to do is show you a little bit of evaluation. So this is our uh, prototype chart. And this is P created by uh, at the, um, Lin, who is um, a PhD student of Dr. Tim Schold. 
and outside in and different. And this color scheme is chosen so that the dark means better. So we can see that actually our approach is quite uh, effective. So and this is some other results. We our um, method is sound, um, although not, not complete, but it's conservative and it's also precise. So in summary, um, I've shown you an effective and precise inference approach. And this is based on the fact that we can um, assign more precise type for expressions and we can um, delay the hard decisions of finding appropriate types for case expressions. And this is based on that we introduce choice types and they can um, in turn be removed for communication. Um, so this brings to the end of my talk. Um, thank you for the attention. Giuseppe Castagna, um, Paris Detroit University. Uh, it seems to me that what you propose is to add uh, some kind of very restricted intersection types to, to the system. For example, in your example, it's mm -hmm. like saying that flow test type R int, R O int, intersection, R bool, R, R O uh, bool. Okay? So uh, my question is is this intuition correct? And if it is so, did you compare with the more general framework of uh, intersection types? Well, in general, um, I want to say that, uh, um, um, you know, the type inference with intersection type, that's not a um, syntax directed, right? You have to add annotations somewhere to say, okay, I need to use intersection type somewhere. And uh, so this is not the case with our choice types. Um, so there are some other uh, differences with intersection types. So f um, the first difference is maybe that uh, these choices are named so that uh, we can either have this synchronization and, uh, but we know that intersection types, we have no way to synchronize with them and whatsoever. So, um, but I haven't thought about using um, intersection types in our, in our system. And so these are the differences that I can see um, between um, using intersection types and choice types. Hi, I'm uh, Richard Eisenberg. Um, so I, I have two related questions. One is, does your system deal with annotations? If the user wants to put in annotations, can it cope with that? And, and the other is the, your, your cross function. Uh -huh. um, I might want to write that and, and give it a, a, a type that has some type function in it. I mean, the, the languages I'm familiar with, with GADT support also support type functions. And so is there a way that that can enter into this picture? So, well, the way our, we deal with type annotation is very messy. We basically, we do inference with or without type annotation for whichever is correct, we pick that one. So, um, and uh, for the cross function, um, I don't know, so I, I just want to um, kind of model, uh, kind of to make my, type inference and the type system as close to um, gadgets as possible. So I think it, for this uh, reason that this just should be rejected. Okay, one more quick question while the next speaker setting up. So Tiark said he wanted some um, controversy. Um, this looks really, 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 really complicated compared to the uh, motivating problem that you gave, to just have it occasionally fail at runtime on things like that doesn't seem so bad, given that we get this sort of failure all the time for things like um, things that only work for non-empty lists, and they might fail if you give them an empty list or what have you. So do you have a better motivating example? Can you even begin to convince me that this is actually worth the cost? I think no matter what, a type inference was gathered.